The Ukraine crisis has put the entire world on high alert. The potential for war to engulf Europe is high. There has been overwhelming support for Ukraine in the West, perhaps due to the degree to which many people in the West can empathize with the Ukrainian society. Images and videos from the crisis spark a sense of injustice in anyone who encounters them. Russia seems squarely to blame for these immoral actions. However, it is extraordinarily important that we analyze the situation rationally, not governed through our emotions, to deduce exactly what the causes of the crisis are and whether those causes justify Russia's aggression. Only when we can differentiate the objective causes from moral justifications will we have a nuanced perspective which allows us to synthesize an appropriate path forward. We need to get this right. The stakes haven't been this high since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, and the situation could escalate into World War III if we're not careful. I argue that NATO expansion, which has ostracized Russia as a great power in Europe and threatens its national security interests, is the primary cause of the Ukraine crisis. This objective cause-effect relationship, however, does not morally justify Russian actions, especially from a liberal Western perspective. Any wise path forward will have to carefully balance these two understandings, prioritizing existential needs of both Russia and the West given the potential for nuclear war. Moscow as recently as the 1980s was effectively the political nucleus for one of the world's superpowers at the time, the Soviet Union. Russia had enjoyed superpower status for nearly half a century since the end of World War II, with all the benefits that come with that power, namely spheres of influence to secure their interests on the world stage. Upon the collapse of the Soviet Union, Moscow lost territorial control over the many satellite states that made up the USSR. With it, Russia was reduced to great power status, and rightfully so, as the defeated party of the Cold War. This structural shift, although personally liberating for many Russians, has also left some in Russia feeling sore about the declining status of their once powerful, proud state. Most importantly, it has left Vladimir Putin, Russia's authoritarian leader since 2000, nostalgic for Russia's glory days. As Putin noted, anyone who doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anyone who wants it restored has no brains. Nationalistic pride remains in Putin's heart. He remembers a time when his nation was central to the world's political structure. However nostalgic for Russia's powerful past Putin may be, he ultimately acknowledges that the Soviet-style system has failed and cannot return. That being said, as a leader of a great power, Putin, along with many other in Russia, feel that their state deserves to be respected, especially with regards to its spheres of influence, which insulate Russia from its enemies. These concerns have been a priority for Russian policymakers since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Upon the brink of the USSR's dissolution, following the collapse of the Berlin Wall, American Secretary of State James Baker, under President George Bush Sr., is rumored to have told Russian President Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand one inch eastward when outlining how NATO troops could operate the former Soviet-held territory in East Germany. Although this encounter is highly debated regarding its legitimacy and no agreements regarding NATO expansion were ever formally made, it still stands that Russian leaders upon the end of the Cold War assumed that Western policymakers understood their concerns about NATO expansion. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is, after all, a Cold War defense institution founded by liberal nations and led by the United States, with the goal of containing the Soviet Union. It shouldn't be a controversial perspective to see that NATO expansion up to Russia's borders would be unnerving for Moscow, given that Russia has historically perceived itself as separate from the West. Russia fundamentally perceives NATO expansion as threatening their sovereignty, security, and national self-interest. As Dr. John Mersheimer has put it, imagine the outrage if China built an impressive military alliance and tried to include Canada and Mexico in it. He correctly assesses that the United States would not put up with such a challenge to their security. And yet, that is the situation that the West has cornered Russia into since their decline as a superpower a few decades ago.
Russia has been very clear about its perception of NATO expansion as a vital threat to their sovereignty, security, and national interest. Again, as Dr. John Mersheimer has noted, during the Bosnian War, NATO imposed a no-fly zone over Bosnia and conducted bombing campaigns against Bosnian Serbs in 1995, prompting Russian President Boris Yeltsin to make fiery remarks regarding Western intervention within their previous spheres of influence in Eastern Europe. Yeltsin said that, quote, this is the first sign of what could happen when NATO comes up to the Russian Federation's borders. The flame of war could burst out across the whole of Europe. The warning was clear enough to some experts in the West. Keep the security alliance away from Russia's borders and out of its sphere of influence. Among the experts that heard Moscow's warnings was George Kennan. George Kennan is known for being the architect of the United States policy of containment during the Cold War, which led to the creation of both NATO and the Marshall Plan, which helped to rebuild Western Europe with the purpose of containing the USSR. In a short piece called A Fateful Error, Kennan wrote in 1997 that expanding NATO would be the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. He went on to say that such a decision may be expected to inflame the nationalistic, anti-Western, militaristic tendencies in Russian opinion, and to impel Russian foreign policy in directions decidedly not to our liking. Despite this warning from a key realist Cold War strategist, with the expertise on Russian political behavior, the powers that be at the time did not heed his advice. Instead, due to unchallenged hegemonic power that the United States possessed during the 1990s and early 2000s, Washington took the advice from liberal internationalists who advised NATO expansion. Since 1999, 14 nations, most of them previous Soviet-controlled states, have joined NATO, with the Ukraine and Georgia both threatening to join the security alliance since 2008. In 2014, the consequences of those decisions began to surface. Putin annexed Crimea after feeling the pressure of the coup d'etat on Ukraine's pro-Russian president Viktor Yanukovych. With Yanukovych out of power and Ukraine instead led by a pro-Western government, Putin felt the stranglehold of the West tightening around Russia's neck, and more specifically, his regime. This blow to Russian security came just six years after George W. Bush expressed strong support for Ukraine and Georgia to become members of NATO. Finding the situation unacceptable, Putin made the expedient decision to invade Ukraine's southern peninsula, securing Russian access to the Black Sea. Another eight years later, after more failed communication between Moscow and the West, Putin again has used military force to secure Russia's sphere of influence. Some commentators in the West have quickly jumped to the conclusion that Putin wishes to reclaim Ukraine and potentially other Soviet states with dreams of recreating some kind of greater Russia. I think this is mistaken, however. The leadership in M Moscow is not that naive. As Putin has stated, anyone who wants the Soviet Union restored has no brains. A long-term territorial occupation of Ukraine is logistically unfeasible considering the current strength of the Russian Federation. They are not the Soviet superpower of previous decades. Acknowledging this simple reality reveals Putin's true wishes, which he spoke of in the speech he gave on February 21, 2022, before invading Ukraine. Claims of denazification aside, which are loose moral propaganda justifications at best, Putin truly wishes to maintain and secure Russia's sphere of influence as a great power in Eastern Europe. In his speech, Putin declares Russia's central importance with regards to the various satellite nations that make up Eastern Europe. Although his version of history is skewed, as many historians and political analysts have noted, his version of history highlights something that is, in part, true. Russia, over the last 100 years, has seen their sphere of influence dwindle, dwindle dramatically. Under the Soviet Union, Russia had large territorial footholds in both Eastern Europe and Central Asia that allowed Moscow to leverage the international system towards the Kremlin's liking. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia has seen large portions of its previous allies fall under Western influence. Putin's actions are not about reclaiming lost territory. His actions are about asserting Russia's sphere of influence as a great power of the world in its own backyard.
which previous Russian leaders have warned as vitally important for peaceful coexistence since the 1990s. That's why they react like this to all our proposals about security. You only need to look at the map to see how did the Western countries keep their word about non-expansion of NATO eastwards. They just lied to us. It's about Russia being able to affect their neighbors' economic and political developments to be beneficial or at the very least not hostile to Moscow. Russia, like China currently, wishes to push back the liberal international order to secure the sovereignty and interests of their nation within their own region, and especially the stability and survival of the current ruling regime. Is Russia's war in Ukraine just, then? No. Causation does not inherently entail justification. Causation in this case is a result of an objective understanding involving a logical sequence of cause and effect events, which utilizes a realist interpretation of international politics. The powers that be in Russia perceive NATO expansion on their doorstep as an existential threat to their regime and its sphere of influence. This causation, however, does not mean it is justified. Justice involves moral assessment, whether actions are fair, reasonable, and oriented towards the good, as well as legal judgment involving laws, norms, and conventions. Since justice depends on both moral and legal assessment, it is informed by values and orienting principles in the minds of the individuals and society assessing the morality and legality of the situation. From the West's moral perspective, Russia's war in Ukraine is not justified. The West's moral assessment is based on liberal values which cherish humanitarian principles. Russia's actions cannot be seen as fair and reasonable, or upholding a morally virtuous position. In fact, from the liberal worldview, Russia's war in Ukraine is reprehensible. This is because the war pursued by Putin to protect his regime and reassert Russia's sphere of influence as a great power is not a fair reason for the humanitarian crisis that the invasion has created. The war is antithetical to basic human rights and freedoms that liberal states of the West hold dear. This appreciation for human rights and dignity, which underpins liberal states' value structure and political orientation, means that any analysis by the West of Russia's invasion of Ukraine concludes that it is morally unjustifiable. Not only is the war in Ukraine unjustifiable on humanitarian principle, but the war cannot be justified either within liberal laws and norms of international politics. Prior to the Second World War, theories of when states could use force and wage war, traditionally referred to as jus ad bellum, rested on the idea that sovereign authorities that govern a state were justified in waging war if it served the state's vital national interests, which the state had the sole right to define. This norm of international politics, based on the realist view of jus ad bellum, eventually led to nations asserting their national self-interest on the world stage via force which facilitated the aggressive foreign policy strategies that eventually led to both World War I and World War II. After these two devastating wars, new liberal norms were adopted internationally and legally instituted by the United States through various international organizations to help cement new conventions regarding justifiable war to prevent catastrophic conflicts in the future. Most importantly, these new norms for just ad bellum were written into the United Nations Charter in 1945, confirming that members of the organization shall abstain in their international relations from resorting to the threat or use of force. The two scenarios where war could be justified according to the Charter are either for self-defense or if it is approved by the UN Security Council, in a sense the executive branch of the UN. However, since the UN is a non-binding international organization without any real military capabilities to maintain international law and order, states often undermine these liberal norms for their own interests. The American invasion of Iraq is one such example. Despite the lack of authority that international organizations hold, the norms and conventions they have set forth since the end of World War II has in part facilitated the remarkable and historically unprecedented long peace between great powers that recent generations have enjoyed. All state actions that betray contemporary understandings and conventions of just war theory 
threaten to push the world back to a more aggressive, zero-sum international system where powerful states use force as a primary tool to secure their self-interest. Liberal norms which facilitate cooperation, despite hypocrisy on America's behalf in various circumstances, must be upheld if peaceful relations between major powers are to continue. The war is not happening in a faraway place like Afghanistan or Vietnam, removed from major power centers, despite how heartless that sounds. It is in Europe, on many great powers' doorstep, threatening the international stability of many of the world's most influential and powerful states. Since upholding modern understandings of just ad bellum should be a priority and should be used as the metric for justified warfare, Russia's actions in Ukraine can be definitively conceptualized as politically and legally unjustifiable. In conjunction with the morally reprehensible analysis of Russia's invasion, Western liberal states can hold firm in their view that the war is not justified. This is all without mentioning that the Ukrainians themselves as a nation are fully justified in defending their state against Russian aggression. What does the wise path forward look like? Only a synthesis between these two perspectives will yield any sustainable peace. On one hand, Russian concerns regarding their security and the perceived existential threat that NATO expansion represents for Putin's regime should be respected and acknowledged. They are a nuclear armed state, after all. When states or their ruling regimes feel existentially threatened is when nuclear weapons would be resorted to. They are seen as guarantees of survival. At the same time, however, Russia should be held accountable for their unjustified aggression in Ukraine. Russia is not morally or politically justified from a liberal perspective. Furthermore, as an independent nation, Ukrainians are justified in their courageous fight for their sovereignty, and Western nations should support their liberal struggle as they already have through economic sanctions on Russia and by providing Ukrainians with small arms like Javelin missiles. However, at the end of the day, compromises must be made on issues that are not of vital interest to the major powers on either side, namely the existential realities for Russia and the West. Despite the war in Ukraine threatening liberal prospects of national self-determination and sovereignty for the Ukrainian people, and causing dramatic humanitarian crisis which all in the West and around the world can empathize with, Ukraine's fate, from a realist perspective, is not tied to that of the West. If we accept the notion that Russia is merely asserting its sphere of influence over its historically most important European ally to secure their own national self-interest, which over 20 years of Russian rhetoric supports, then we can conclude that Russia does not have ambitions to conquer other European states. From this assessment, we can strictly analyze if Ukraine's fate is truly an existential threat to the West, to Berlin, Paris, London, Ottawa, or Washington. The answer should be a clear no. Is Ukraine's fate an existential threat, even if only in imagination, to Russia? Yes. Definitively yes. Russia cannot tolerate Ukraine becoming a part of its enemy's security alliance. This is Geopolitics 101. If nuclear weapons were not a concern, then perhaps this realist rule to geopolitics could be ignored, and the West could become more directly involved in the situation. But unfortunately, Russia has the largest stockpile of nuclear warheads in the world. Whenever nuclear weapons are in play, de-escalation between nuclear states should always be the priority. According to some experts, odds of nuclear weapons being used as of May 2022 is already an alarming 1-2%. to As mentioned previously, this is one of the most dangerous moments in modern history. Of course, the Ukrainians should fight for their sovereignty and independence from Russian oversight. The West should do everything in their power to help the Ukrainians struggle, short of escalating the situation in Eastern Europe on more structural levels. Despite the war in Ukraine being the closest we've been to nuclear holocaust since the Cold War, 
it seems that most people are out of touch with this understanding at the moment, considering how widespread support is in the West for structural escalatory measures towards Russia. For example, it had become a popular, although alarmingly naive, sentiment for the West to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine in the early days of the war. Currently, the West is on track to expand NATO membership to both Finland and Sweden. These are unnecessary escalatory measures based on reactionary interpretations of Russia's motives, which increase the potential for catastrophe. We need to move away from escalating the potential for nuclear warfare. De-escalation is the only sustainable path forward, which requires the difficult understanding of what is existentially necessary for both Moscow and the West. Any de-escalatory measures taken in this tragic war must recognize Russia's concerns regarding Ukraine's security alliance and how that could impact Russian sovereignty. Namely, Russia needs guarantees that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. Russia needs guarantees regarding the future of Ukraine politically. A realist framework for understanding the situation should be given priority over liberal idealism. We need to look for an off-ramp in this tragic war, and any meaningful solution must recognize the facts of geopolitics. Although the war in Ukraine is an unjust war, the war cannot be outright won by the West when utilizing a realist framework to understand power politics. Compromises must be made. Supporting Ukraine's struggle is a noble cause and should be pursued as long as it does not structurally escalate tensions between the West and Russia. Strong resistance ensures more leverage for Ukraine at the negotiating table. That said, Russia is very unlikely to retreat from a humiliating defeat in Ukraine before they use their nuclear might to assert their political needs. Utilizing a realist perspective, where state survival, self-interest, and power politics govern international relations, Russia will not tolerate Ukraine becoming an ally to its perceived moral enemy, the United States and the liberal West. Therefore, Ukraine politically must either become a neutral state or it must lean towards Russia. It's not happily ever after, but it's the lesser of all evils. Escalation towards an all-out defeat of Russia in Ukraine could spell the end of our civilization. Russia and Putin will suffer over the coming years, but the West cannot claim total victory in this particular situation. If there's anything we should have learned from the Cold War, it's that de-escalation between nuclear powers should always be the priority, despite however unfavorable that is in the short run. It's the only long-term strategy.